Thanks for, uh, for joining today's presentation on understanding NIH programs. My name is Megan Columbus. I'm the communications director at NIH's Office of Extramural Research. Uh, you may have already seen me in a previous session. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's session. I'm very pleased to introduce you to the woman who's tasked with providing leadership on the development, implementation, and evaluation of policies and programs to train, sustain, and enhance the diversity of the future biomedical research workforce. Welcome, please, the director of NIH's Division of Biomedical Research Workforce, Dr. Erica Boone. And before I hand Erica the virtual podium, I just want to make one more introduction. Dr. Mohor Singh Gupta, also from NIH's Division of Biomedical Research Workforce, is going to be in the background helping to answer questions in the Q&A today. So thanks to you both for joining us, and let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Megan, for that awesome introduction. I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2023 NIH Grants Conference. I hope that you've been enjoying the sessions thus far. Um, tomorrow, we will have several panel discussions that are focusing on topics that I think that this group will find of interest, and that includes diversity within the biomedical research workforce, optimizing mentoring relationships, and the NIH Unite effort. So I will be moderating all three of those uh, panel discussions, so I hope that you will join us. However, for this session, this afternoon, it's going to be geared more so towards those individuals that are newer to the world policies programs of NIH. I'm going to give a high level overview of NIH grants by career stage um, and also talk about a few policies and programs like the ESI um, program, um, as well as family friendly policies that can be helpful to navigating uh, your research career during those early stages. I'll also provide some resources and tips for how to find information and stay abreast of the latest policies and programs at the NIH. So let's go ahead and get started. Of course, you all already know that NIH was uh, founded in 1880, and we are the primary U.S. agency responsible for biomedical and research health, uh, or health research, and we are the largest public funder of biomedical research in the world. Last year, NIH in 2022, um, we had an operating budget of about $45 billion. A little under 5% was devoted to research training and career development awards. Almost 60% of the operating budget went towards funding more than 50,000 research project grants to more than 2,500 universities, medical schools, and other research institutions in every state. And of course, I forgot to turn off my team. So I have lots of people who are saying yay for the conference session. <laughs> so if you can hear my voice, stop teaming me. So uh, you can see here that there are 27 different institute centers and offices here at the NIH. The Office or the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce is located within the Office of Extramural Research under the Office of the Director. So of course, there's one NIH, but each IC has its own mission, its own budget, its own activities, its own way of doing things. So how does everyone make sense of any of these things? So we'll start off with giving some tips on how to engage with individuals from NIH. Who do you talk to? When do you talk to these individuals? So as you can see here, there are three different groups of individuals here at NIH that we're going to discuss very briefly. So you have your program officer, your scientific review officer, and your grants management officer. So of course, your, pro your program officer is the individual who's responsible for helping to identify areas of scientific need and priority areas. They communicate these NIH priorities to investigators within the extramural community, such as yourself. And they also communicate information back to IC leadership about the state of the science and trends in their scientific areas. The scientific review officer manages grant reviews. They appoint members to review panels. They prepare summary statements. And grants management officers, as you can guess, they deal with budgets. They oversee them and they ensure that we are, or grantees um, are compliant with NIH policies and regulations. So when do you talk to them? So for program officers, you're gonna to wanna to reach out to them well before your application is due. Uh, these are the individuals that you're going to want to talk to because they understand what are the priority uh, research areas as well as funding priorities for their institutes and centers. So you're definitely going to want to make sure that you reach out and communicate with them so that you can understand 
how your research fits into the priorities of that institute because you wanna definitely make sure that your research baby uh, finds its right home. So uh, the scientific review officers. So after your application has been assigned to a review committee, um, you're gonna wanna contact your scientific review officer. So this is a person that you talk to if you have to provide any missing information or supplementary information as well. Grants management officers, you can contact them before or after the review so that you can discuss any issues with the budget, if you have a change of institution, um, if there's an issue with the start dates, et cetera. So how do you find that right program officer? Um, so first things that you can talk to your research mentors and your colleagues, they've, they've probably been in research for a long time, so they probably have some really great suggestions of where to start. There's also the NIH reporter. Here you can find information on who are your competitors. What is that research out there that's been funded by NIH? Which ICs are funding them and according to which activity codes? So a fellowship, a career development award, a research project grant, so on and so forth. Next there's NIH matchmaker. This is what I call the plenty of fish that matches research investigators with their perfect program officer. So if you type into the search tool, um, um, keywords, or for example, your specific aims, you get a plethora of information that you can find useful. So for example, you can find uh, which ICs are funding research in your, in your particular area what mechanisms or what activity codes are being used to fund it? What are the study sections that have been reviewing this information? One thing that I wanna get clear or that I wanna reiterate over and over again while we talk today is that normalize reaching out. No one can exist on their own. You don't exist in a vacuum and you cannot conduct a research career just by doing it on your own. So make sure that you are normalizing, reaching out to your social networks, whether they are your co-mentors, whether they are your peers, whether they are your program officers here at the NIH. Uh, so when you reach out to a program officer, always reach out, as I said before, well before your deadline. Send them some information about your research, what your research goals are. Um, who do you want to be, you know, in the research world? How do you see your, your research developing? They can utilize this information in order to assist you to find appropriate mechanisms that are suitable to helping you to navigate your research career. So now let's talk about funding opportunity announcements. What's an FOA? So for any application that you submit to NIH, you're gonna apply through a funding opportunity announcement or an FOA. And this is simply a vehicle by which NIH and other federal grant agencies announce their funding opportunities. All federal agencies utilize FOAs. So FOAs can be program announcements, requests for applications, notices of funding availability, parent announcements, et cetera. And each of these um, outline the program goals, objectives, activity codes, et cetera. So for example, program announcements, these are FOAs that identify specific program areas of science. They can have specific set-aside uh, funds. They can have specific review dates. They're usually ongoing with regards to their receipt dates, their standard, so you can control when you're going to apply, as opposed to a request for applications. These are special FOAs that identify or solicit research in very specific predefined areas. There's the predetermined amount of set-aside funds, as well as number of awards that will be um, provided by the, you know, the supporting ICs, and there's usually only one receipt date. So this is um, a diagram of the, or a cartoon, if you want to say, of the NIH Research Training website. Here you can provide, you can see tons of information about funding opportunities, et cetera, according to career stage, and we're going to get into that just a little bit. So this diagram here, again, shows funding opportunities by career phase. Um, so from undergrad to um, pre-doc to post-doc to early investigator stages and beyond. So we're going to take a brief tour of these activity codes. But before we get started on this funding roll call, I want to talk to you a little bit about the value of research and administrative supplements to help you to enhance your career progression. So diversity supplements. The goal of the diversity supplement are to assist in diversifying the biomedical research workforce by supporting promising investigators from diverse and underrepresented groups who seek to develop research capabilities and research, or I'm sorry, career development experiences that will assist them in advancing towards research independence. Diversity supplements can be utilized as a bridge for, towards an F or a K, but they can be utilized to support many different career stages from undergrad to faculty and provide funding from $5,000 to $10,000 per year based on the career stage to support salary, limited research costs, et cetera. 
So if you have any questions about how to submit how to submit a diversity supplement application, eligibility, um, priority scientific areas uh, of interest to NIHICs, please consult the FOA that's outlined at the top of the slide, but also check to see who your program officers are within the tab or within the link for the IC specific tables. Reach out to these program officers, have a conversation about how to apply and what's important for your application. So key administrative supplements. So as you see here on the left, research continuity supplements provide support to enhance retention and minimize departures of early career investigators from the research workforce due to the experience of critical life uh, events such as childbirth, illness, et cetera. The uh, mentor case supplement is intended to ensure continuity of research among recipients of mentor K awards as they transition into research independence. And the second supplement is intended to enhance retention of investigators that are facing critical life events who are transitioning either to the renewal of their first, um, from their first to a second RPG or to a second new NIH RPG. So most individuals that receive or apply for and receive our research continuity awards use these funds to support the services of additional personnel, such as technicians, statisticians, uh, to obtain computational services, um, or to provide or purchase research supplies or equipment. Um, and this is to help them to keep their research going while they're working through their life event that they're experiencing. On the right, you have your reentry and reintegration supplements to support full or part-time research for researchers that are returning to the scientific workforce after a lengthy separation. So I do want to take a moment to highlight the reintegration supplement, which addresses the critical need of scientists who have been adversely affected by unsafe or discriminatory environments to rapidly enable them to transition into new research environments that are safe and supportive so that they can continue their research progression. Uh, I also want to note that pre-doc and postdoc students are eligible to apply for reintegration supplements. Lastly is the loan repayment program, which can be a real career saver for many investigators. So loan debt is recognized as by many early career investigators as one of the biggest career um, impediments or barriers to starting and continuing their research progress. So in exchange for a two-year commitment to perform research in an NIH mission critical research area, NIH can commit to repaying up to $50,000 in eligible student loan debt. Of course, the amount that an individual will receive will be dependent on their loan debt level. Overall, the success rate for this program is around 50%. There are six different um, types of LRPs to choose from. And how do you find out more information about the LRPs? Of course, you can check out the available resources on the LRP website, which are indicated here, www.lrp.nih.gov. And what else am I going to say? I'm going to say reach out to your program officer. And then also I'm going to say contact the loan repayment program uh, for more information. So I'd like to point out a few family-friendly policies that you should be aware of. So the first is that the NRSAs allow for 60 days or eight weeks of parental leave for fellows and trainees. And um, NIH also provides um, up to 50 percent I'm sorry, $2,500 per year to help defray childcare costs. So I'm getting a message that there are audio issues. Megan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. I just want to make sure um, that that we're not having audio issues. Um, so NIH has also implemented a mechanism to report the experience of discrimination and other forms of harassment as well. Um, the link can be found uh, on NIH grants, uh, the NIH grants.nih.gov website. Uh, to be pretty transparent, uh, when I was a graduate student, um, I had a child when I was in graduate school. So that child care cost benefit would have definitely been of use to me when I was a graduate student. But then also when I was a postdoc, unfortunately, I experienced sexual harassment. I had no one to report this to, and I didn't feel like I had someone that would be able to help me. Um, so neither that child care um, allowance nor the reporting portal that NIH has available were available. But I'm hoping that if you are um, out there in the research world um, are in need of, of uh, these services or, or these options. If you need to report, make a report, or if you need to take advantage of child care costs, please, please, please look at um, the NIH website for additional information. 
So now let's continue this. Let's talk more about funding opportunities. We have about 15 minutes more left of me talking, so let's get into this. So you've all heard a lot about the NRSA Award, which provides training opportunities for individuals at various stages of education and training. Beginning at the baccalaureate level via predoctoral fellowships and through the postdoctoral phase via the postdoctoral fellowships and institutional training grants, as you can see listed here. Each of the NRSAs have common features, including the provision of tuition and fees, stipends to help defray living costs, and institutional allowances for fellowships and training related expenses for trainees. Um, the T32s provide awards to institutions to support research training activities for graduate and or postdoctoral trainees. Now here we're highlighting the institutional predoctoral T32, which enables promising predoctoral students to obtain individualized mentor research training from outstanding faculty while they're conducting their dissertation research. I mean, it allows for them to gain skills that they need to transition to the next stage of their uh, research career. Individual fellowships, including the F30, F31, the diversity F31, and the F32 are outlined on the right. Um, as an example, the pre-doc um, NRSA F31 provides up to five years of support to allow um, predoctoral students the opportunity to develop the technical, operational, professional, and research uh, skills that they need in order to conduct uh, research and transition their careers um, into in the biomedical research workforce. The F31 is also used to enhance workforce diversity through the F31 Diversity Fellowship Award. So the most newly graduated doctoral level researchers would benefit from postdoctoral training uh, and, and further career development. There are some early career investigators that are interested and ready to skip that postdoc and launch directly. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm talking too fast for the ASL interpreter, so I'm going to slow down for everyone. Um, uh, so I think I'm just so excited to be able to give all of you this information, and I'm speaking really, really fast. Um, but let's get back to the DP5. So for individuals that do not need to partake of the uh, postdoctoral period and they're ready to launch into their um, research careers, we have the NIH Director's Early Independence Award, which allows for exceptional investigators to pursue uh, independent research careers directly after the completion of their research um, doctoral degree or their clinical residency. So in essence, it allows for individuals to bypass the traditional postdoctoral training experience and enter into an independent research career. So for those individuals that are seeking to continue uh, from pre-doc training uh, into postdoctoral training, NIH supports a number of programs, including this transition F99 K00 award. So this is a transition award that allows for um, promising uh, outstanding graduate students from diverse backgrounds um, to facilitate transition um, from graduate studies into postdoctoral positions. So of course, as I indicated, this is a uh, two-phase award. So in the first phase, it's one to two years um, uh, while the individual is completing their dissertation research. And then they can transition into to K00 once they transition into their their postdoctoral studies. To find out more information about the F99K00, um, I think that you have access to these slides, um, so you can access these links as well to find out more information. All righty, so, so for those individuals that are ready to move on and from the graduate phase into additional mentor career development phases of their career, we have the Career Development Awards. So there are common features of Career Development Awards. Um, so they provide salary and research support for a sustained period of protected research time, usually between three to five years uh, for intensive mentor research career development under the guise of an experienced mentor, of course. So the expectation is that through this sustained period of research career development and training that awardees are going to be in a position to launch into their independent research careers and be competitive uh, for research project grant funding such as the R01. Here on the screen you see some caveats related or common features of the K award.
So now briefly we'll review the different types of K awards. Um, you can see this here for yourself. Keep in mind for the sake of time, I'm not going to be going in depth for all of these. Um, there are other sessions that are planned and that we, where we have um, uh, pre-recorded uh, sessions um, from uh, previous years of the NIH Grants Conference that you can consult that go deeply into all of the elements that are required for submission of the K01. But very, I mean, for the K award, sorry. But for the K01, one, this uh, particular mentored research award supports inten intensive supervised career development experience in biomedical or behavioral sciences, leading to research independence. So the K01 is also utilized um, by NIH ICs to enhance workforce diversity um, or for individuals who propose to train in a new research field. Of course, the K01 is the most often applied for K01 or K a career development award, I'm sorry, um, that NIH supports. The K08 provides for protected time for individuals with clinical doctorate degrees. The K23 uh, supports career development of investigators who uh, made a commitment to patient-oriented research. And the K25, not listed here, supports investigators whose quantitative science and engineering research has thus far not been focused primarily on questions that are related to health and disease. So now let's talk a little bit about another transition award that NIH has, and it is the K99R00. I'm pretty sure that you all have heard a lot about this uh, K99, uh, Z K99R00 transition award. And the goal of this award is to facilitate timely transition from the mentor predoctoral phase to an independent research position with independent NIH research support. So of course, um, as you know, the K99 is a phased award with the first phase being uh, one to two years uh, of the mentor K99 or postdoctoral phase. And the second phase, the R00 beginning once the postdoc starts a faculty position. And this phase can be for up to three years. Um, as noted on the slide, there are several different uh, types or flavors, if you will, of the K99 R00 uh, that are available uh, from NIH and they target different investigator types and research areas. For example, there is the physician scientist K99, the dual degree dentist scientist K99 R00, and the brain K99 R00 to promote diversity. There's also the mosaic. And speaking of mosaic, because there remains a compelling need to develop um, additional strategies to promote transition to independent positions for scientists from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds, NIH has the Mosaic K99R00. So the Mosaic framework establishes the formation of um, mutually supportive scholar cohorts that are based on scientific areas that span uh, from the K99 to the R00 award phases. And it provides the scholars with the opportunity to engage in career development activities, um, which are facilitated via professional societies that are located on the right side of the screen. Um, and these, in the, these uh, scholars are able to take advantage of peer networks as they engage in career development activities including team building, professional skills and networking opportunities, mentoring, career development, etc. I want for you to keep in mind that there are timelines for new as well as renewal K applications. So make sure that you are consulting the NIH on um, the grants.nih.gov website uh, for more information. We also have small grant programs like the R03, um, which provides limited funding for pilot and feasibility studies or the conduct of pilot and feasibility studies that will um, put the uh, investigator um, in line for applying or using that data to apply for larger grants. Um, we have the R15 and the R16, which are focusing on supporting small scale research projects that are conducted by faculty at mostly teaching institutions to help for them to improve or enhance their research capacity, but also provide student research opportunities. We have the R21, which provides two-year funding to support new exploratory research projects that can be used to develop pilot or feasibility studies as well. 
and the DP2, which is the, the Director's New Innovator Award, um, which supports highly innovative, high impact, out of the box ideas um, that may be a little bit too risky or at too much of an early stage um, to be able to fare well under traditional peer review um, processes. One thing to note is that no detailed experimental plan or preliminary um, data are required for the DP2. So this is really important for early career investigators. Next, we have the MIR, or the Maximizing Investigators Research Award. It's an R35, as well as the CATS ESI Award. Both of these are ESI, or Early Stage Investigator Targeted Awards. Two key elements of both of these awards um, is that preliminary data, again, is not required or expected. And this is a bonus for early career investigators, as it allows for them to be able to apply for and secure RPG funding earlier in their research careers. Um, also so while the proposed research can rely on prior work or foundational expertise um, of the investigator, it must represent a different direction uh, within their research, and it can involve a new approach, methodology, technology, or paradigm. Uh, the benefit, as I was saying before, is that it increases opportunity and chance for new scientific discovery for these investigators. Uh, so please make sure that you are engaging in conversation with your program officer um, prior to your application so that you can really understand how to target your application for both of these awards. So now before I wrap up, We'll talk a little bit about the R01, and I think that everyone is familiar with the R01. This is the original and the oldest grant mechanism that is utilized by NIH. Um, I do want to point out, as you see with the two boxes at the lower right of the um, of the slide, that NIH has recently published two R01s that promote workforce diversity. So please check out these two specific R01s. So now I'm going to wrap up, give you some more um, interesting and useful information. I've used the term early stage investigator several times during this presentation. So why is this important? So ESIs or early stage investigators are considered to be are, are investigators rather that are either within 10 years of receiving their terminal research degree or completing their most recent clinical training, whichever date is later, um, and have not received substantial NIH independent research award as of yet. So why is this important? It's important because ESI status has its benefits. So um, for example, NIH sets targets uh, for funding for early career investigators or early stage investigators, um, um, setting a higher R01 pay line, which in essence helps to prioritize applications with meritorious scores for funding. By doing so, we are trying to ensure more parity in success rates among early stage and established investigators. Also, during the peer review process, peer reviewers look more at potential than long-term track record of achievement. Uh, they are encouraged to weigh in early stage investigators' academic and research background and place less emphasis on preliminary data or the presence of preliminary data and extensive publication records as compared to more established investigators. Lastly, like here on the screen as we point out, is ESI extensions. So some investigators may have lapses in their research or their research training or have experienced periods of less than full-time effort due to the experience of a critical life event. NIH will consider requests to extend ESI status period for reasons that can include medical concerns, disability, family, care responsibilities, natural disasters, et cetera. Um, so as I said, why is this important? Because ESI timeframe is that 10 years from either your um, receipt of your doctoral level degree or your most recent clinical training. And as we said um, earlier within this slide, it grants you certain benefits. So being able to extend this benefit if a person encounters a critical life event that takes them out of their research and inhibits their research progress is very important. So principal investigators can submit a request for an ESI extension via the ESI extension request link that's found in the education section of the PI's personal profile in ERA Commons. We just have a couple more slides to go. I want to call attention to the CSR Early Reviewer or ECR program. 
I cannot tell you how beneficial experience within this program can be. Um, I think that the most valuable part of this experience is that you are, or um, early career investigators are working side by side with very accomplished researchers in their field. They're hearing what goes on when grants are reviewed. They're understanding where others go wrong and where they can improve. They're being, um, they're, um, being able to develop more critical thinking skills by participating in this project process. So if you're interested in participating in the CSR um, Early Career Review Program, check out the CSR, the NIH CSR uh, website. Anytime the NIH wants to communicate important policy issues, we do so via publication of notices. So some examples of notices are listed here. For example, there are notices regarding previous changes to biographical sketches, requirement for um, ORCID IDs, um, et cetera. This is the grants.nih.gov website. This is a central resource for information on grants, policy, uh, and more for NIH. Make sure that you visit the grants and funding webpage often. You can find important information about grants, about policy, about compliance, reporting, and find funding um, opportunity announcements here. You can also sign up to receive weekly emails, usually on Fridays, um, that contain new funding opportunity announcements and notices um, published within the NIH guide. Also sign up here to stay abreast of the latest news from the Office of Extramural Research, including the Open Mic blog and receive other important resources. The final thing that I'd like to leave you with is that I wanna quickly highlight the NIH UNITE initiative. So in 2020, UNITE was established to identify and address structural racism within the NIH and the greater NIH supported scientific community. So with representation from across all of the 27 different institutes and centers at NIH, UNITE's um, aim is to establish an equitable and civil culture within the biomedical research enterprise and reduce barriers to racial equity in the biomedical research workforce. UNITE has five different working groups, each acting as a think tank to promote equity and promote bold ideas and catalyze new actions. I am the co-chair of uh, the, I am one of the co-chairs of the UNITE E committee. And the charge of this committee is to identify and make recommendations uh, to change policies, practices, and cultures that contribute to a persistent lack of inclusiveness and diversity of funding equity within the biomedical research ecosystem, and then develop strategies to address them. The goal is to aid NIH in achieving meaningful diversity and inclusion of personnel and funding equity as a value and a conscious practice. So based on the work of Committee E, uh, within the next several months, there are going to be several new and revised policy changes, as well as funding opportunities that will be implemented and available to the extramural community. Um, here's a slide for UNITE. This is summary advice about navigating NIH programs. As I said before, review your IC priorities, learn about the NIH um, application review process. You guys are in luck because you are participating in the grants conference, make early contact with your program officers, engage your social networks, talk to people about their experiences, talk with your colleagues because they're knowledgeable as well. If you have an opportunity to do so, study successful grant applications and keep abreast of the latest in funding opportunity announcements from NIH. Arthur, we, like have, we have a bunch of questions that we would like to try and get to if we can. We're done. Yay, okay. Um, so keep your answers brief so that we can get through as many of these as we can, okay? Um, I picked some that have been upvoted and so, uh, a general theme that I, I captured, I think, in this question, which is, what is NIH doing to support the careers of researchers who had to take time away from research to be family caretaker? Are there resources to jumpstart their careers? Um, um, if they're no longer an early career scholar, is there still a bump in a review score if you're a first-time submitter? That kind of thing. Can you speak to okay, that? Okay, so there are 
there were lots of questions in there. And within the slide deck, um, we had uh, an answer to some of those questions. So I think that um, I've highlighted some of the family-friendly policies that we have here available at NIH. I also highlighted um, the re-entry, reintegration supplements that we have available, as well as the research continuity supplements for career um, development awardees, as well as F um, recipients, I'm sorry, not F, but individuals who are applying for their renewal um, RPG or for their second RPG. Um, so those are some of the um, funding opportunities um, that individuals are eligible for to help them to be able to continue their research careers when they've had to take time away in order to deal with life. Great. And so what about those people who have already, um, they're, they're no longer ESIs, do they get any uh, benefit to being a new investigator? Um, currently, we do have, um, remember the R01, uh, I had the slide on the R01, and we had those diversity, the two diversity R01s that were indicated. The second one is really to promote workforce diversity, um, uh, to incorporate individuals like new investigators, individuals from diverse backgrounds, as well as those individuals that are considered to be new investigators. They have not been able to acquire um, uh, independent or uh, high levels of research funding or independent research funding from the NIH. So this particular opportunity is something that really does incorporate them in their needs. I really do feel like, and this is just my opinion, so don't tell anybody I said so, we won't share this beyond the hundred people that we have on here, but I think that we need to have more of a focus on new investigators because we have that gap in between new invest, I mean, early stage investigators and then established investigators. And then what do we do in the middle? Right. So that's shared between you and the 1,700 people we have here. Yeah, um, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so any general advice for community colleges where research is not a priority, but where programmatic grants can bring important benefits to students? How can yes. they engage and mod motivate their faculty and leadership? Absolutely. So I was... I did not attend community colleges, but when I was an undergrad, I did attend a very small historically black college in Alabama called Talladega College. And my first supports were from 